Every available seat in the Central Criminal Court at the Old Bailey was taken on Friday, 26th April, 1895, when Oscar Wilde, looking haggard and worn, under pressure from prosecutor Edward Carson, delivered his Love That Dare Not Speak Its Name address in defense of his love for the younger Lord Alfred Douglas, known to all as Bosey. The case was, by then, already lost. Wilde's health and spirits had deteriorated to a startling degree. The newspapers were universally hostile. Street ballads and cheap pamphlets were beginning to appear. Wilde's letters were being burnt, his books thrown away. It was a shocking fall from grace for a man whose most famous play, The Importance of Being Earnest, had debuted only six weeks earlier. More than 125 years after the most famous trial of the 19th century, we need to reappraise Oscar Wilde. Firstly, we need to reconsider the boys and young men with whom he had sexual relations. Many biographers have been indifferent to them, with one stating they were already steeped in vice by the time they met Wilde. But most of these boys were teenagers when they were paid for sex by the famous author and playwright. Is it fair to assert that, emotionally and socially, the identities of 16 and 17 year old boys are decisively formed, to the extent that they can be too steeped in vice to warrant being viewed, at any level, as credible or sympathetic or conflicted in their judgment? Many were callous and opportunistic, some were blackmailers, but most were also from poor backgrounds, and had they not been so very terribly hard up, in the words of one, there is far less likelihood they would have accepted the offers of middle-aged Alfred Taylor, who, in the fog and grime of Victorian London, would wander speculatively where boys tended to mill and loiter, accost the poorer-looking teenagers, and offer them a place to stay in his lodgings in Little College Street. Many of the boys would share his bed and then be stared into making some money from prostitution behind the screen curtains in the stale air heavy with incense. Picture the following scenes. Oscar Wilde and his partner, Bosie, invited by Taylor to have dinner with Taylor's latest find, 16-year-old Fred Atkins, a cynical cockney lad, rough, pimply-faced the grown men at the table exchanging sly, ironical looks. Wild with Atkins in a Paris hotel, Wild going into the boys' room to perform certain operations with his mouth, the pair returning to London and Wild summoning the boy almost daily for sex. Wild taking 17-year-old renter Alfred Wood back to his home in Tite Street, paying him two pounds. In the private room of a restaurant, with shaded red candles at the table, Wilde with 17-year-old Charles Parker, feeding him preserved cherries from his own mouth, then taking the boy to the Savoy Hotel. Wilde summoning the boy each day for a week by telegram. Wilde staying at the Savoy Hotel for a month and binging on a procession of teenage boys, a chambermaid describing a sallow-faced, rough-looking boy about 14 years old in Wilde's bed. The sheets always in a most disgusting state, covered in Vaseline, semen and soil. The 16-year-old servant boy, Walter Granger, Wilde unbuttoning the boy's trousers and stroking his, quote, private parts, buying his silence with 10 shillings. In a classic stratagem of sexual abuse, while threatening the boy each time, telling him he would be in, quote, very serious trouble and would, quote, go to prison if he told anyone what had happened. Wilde renting a house with Bosey, summoning Granger as a servant, bringing the boy into his room every night, Granger deposing that Wilde, quote, acted as before and that he felt, quote, scared. The writer, André Gide, recounted sharing a pair of youths with Wilde while in Algeria, with Gide's companion being aged about 13. Wilde and Bosey encountering two teenage boys on the beach at the seaside resort of Worthing. They're inviting the boys for a sail. 
Oscar inviting his favourite, Alphonse, who had turned 16 a few weeks earlier for an evening walk. Wilde, quote, suddenly taking hold of the boy, reaching inside his trousers and masturbating him until he, quote, spent. Large sums of money being given to Alphonse. A modern interpretation of Wilde has to consider that while he was writing the importance of being earnest, he was essentially paying a 16-year-old for sex. The total sum over the course of these liaisons, as inferred by the prosecution, was the equivalent, in today's terms, of one and a half thousand pounds, a staggering sum to a simple country boy. In the present day, we ought to be less swayed by historical context. If it is illegal and immoral to pay 17 and 16 year olds for sex, both by the standards of Wilde's time and by the standards of our time, then there isn't much ambiguity. In fact, if Wilde's trial were held today, his plays would be whisked off the stage quicker than back then, and his jail sentence, two years hard labour, would be longer. Paying for sex with a boy of 16 or 17 carries with it a sentence of up to seven years. Again, historical context shouldn't mitigate as much as it is often allowed to. In Wilde's time, the age of consent, for girls at least, was 16. His relationships or encounters with boys and young men all had, in one way or another, power dynamics entirely in his favour. All were poorer and prone to the lure and domination of a financial quid pro quo, or a steady stream of gifts as an implicit quid pro quo, a context that society then, and now, deems beyond the sophistication of 16 and 17 year olds to consent to. In the case of the servant Walter Granger, there was an exploitation of a position of trust. There were vulnerabilities in some of the boys' backgrounds. Estrangement from parents, a dead father, a surviving parent struggling to make ends meet and unable to stay abreast of her son's whereabouts. I grew careless of the lives of others, Wilde wrote in De Profundis. I took pleasure where I found it and moved on. Perhaps the most jarring instance of this lack of empathy and consideration was at the defining moment of his trial for gross indecency. Cross-examined about the 16-year-old servant, Walter Granger, the prosecutor, Edward Carson, asked Wilde if he had ever kissed the boy. Wilde's flippant, callous answer was extraordinary, given the profoundly serious public context. Oh no, never in my life. He was a peculiarly plain boy. His appearance was so very, unfortunately, very ugly. I pitied him for it. It was the climactic moment of the case. In being so oddly cavalier, Wilde had more or less incriminated himself, admitting he would have kissed the boy had he not been so ugly. For the most part, Oscar Wilde was a kind and generous figure, but he is due for reassessment in light of the gradual contemporary appreciation of the complex territory where consent, influenced by power relations, strays into abuse. We also have to consider Wilde's two most intimate companions, Bosey and Robbie Ross, and the extent to which Wilde tacitly endorsed their behaviour. Ross, on holiday with family friends, entered into an affair with a 16-year-old schoolboy, Claude Danzy, a naive boy of, quote, no particular character, from a dysfunctional family with an alcoholic abusive father. Bosey and Wilde set the boy up at the Albemarle Hotel in London. A contemporary recounted that, on Saturday, the 16-year-old boy slept with Bosey, on Sunday he slept with Oscar. They were so rapacious that they neglected to get the boy back to school on time. This precipitated a crisis in which the boy, buckling under the strain of accounting for being three days late, blurted out to his headmaster and then to his shocked and distraught parents what had happened. More appallingly, it emerged that Robbie Ross had also been having sex with the 14-year-old son of his hosts. Wilde seemed indifferent to his friend's underage encounters. Douglas in Egypt wrote of being in a sexual relationship with a boy of 14. Wilde wrote of Douglas later having an affair with another boy in Paris, aged 14. There was an unsettlingly familiar tone of entitlement that is very contemporary. I am one of those who are made for exceptions, not for laws, he once declared. The truth will never fully be known in all of these historical encounters, and, as Wilde also observed, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. It would be priggish to suggest there aren't young men on the make, or others, in a youthful phase, flexible about their route to gratification. 
What is valid, however, is to assert that Wilde often strayed beyond those notions into more contentious territory, and while he was rightly recognised as a victim of Victorian morality and hypocrisy, he has come to be lauded a little too fondly and leniently as a martyr and an icon. The pendulum now needs to swing a little back the other way, away from the blasé assessments given of him time and again in recent biographies, works in which Walter Granger is blithely referred to as Poor Walter or The Luckless Walter, Alphonse Conway as a boy who was picked up and for whom it was no small matter to be the companion of a man of genius. 18-year-old Edward Shelley is dismissed as a foolish, impressionable, and altogether sad young man who had a brief and inconsequential affair. It is likely that Oscar Wilde would be almost as scathing of identity politics and cancel culture as he was of conservative morals, philistinism, and hypocrisy. He would have found it intellectually vapid, so it is important to not be strident and insist on taking him down a notch. What is valid is asserting that our understanding of the complex territory of consent, played out many times in public over the last few years, invites a reassessment that is intellectually honest, even if it leads to conclusions about an icon that we might not like.